Good evening. My name is Dr. Lisa McBride, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and what we like to say, the big B, belonging. We want all of our students to have a sense of belonging and to bring their whole self to Geisel, as well as our faculty and our staff. We created the Conversations That Matter speaker series to examine the pivotal role that people play in creating an inclusive academic workplace that's built for the 21st century. After our hosting of the future of mental health and well-being with our current and former U.S. Surgeon Generals, that being the, all of the living Surgeon Generals, I think that was a very historic event, we began to ask ourselves the question, how does inclusion impact our well-being? And I'll just let that sit. How does inclusion impact our well-being? So we began to look at recent neuroscience research and current work and best practice by uh, Surgeon General v Dr. Vivek Murthy, who uh, has created a, firm, a framework for building a culture of connection. So what we began to do in our office is to think about ways that we could create a series like the Conversations That Matter series that would allow us to unpack the art of asking questions that would lay the foundation for trust, psychological safety, openness, listening, and most importantly, empathy. As healthcare providers, as public health providers, we are constantly wrestling and trying to assess trauma-informed care, and also the pedagogy of cultural humility. How do we approach each and every one of you with a sense of gratitude and humility? And so this series, uh, started with a session or a, a session or event around caring for Muslim patients during Ramadan to today's session on Days of Remembrance, Executive Order 9066. And so the series weaved together storytelling and research-based conversations with globally recognized authors, alumni, experts, as well as students. So if you have a conversation that matters, or that if you want to be brave and have a conversation that matters, join the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, DICE, for a conversation that matters. So the next voice that you will hear will be the reason why we do this work in our office is for the students. The next voice that you will hear will be Eric Wang, who is a first year student who's gonna introduce our, our distinguished guests, and then we're gonna get into the fireside chat. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. McBride, for that introduction. So my name is Eric Wong. I'm a current first year medical student at the Geisel School of Medicine, and I currently also serve as one of the student leaders for the Asian, Pacific American Student Medical, excuse me, uh, the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association here at the Geisel School of Medicine. So I have the pleasure of introducing our two distinguished guests tonight. First, we'll be introducing Dr. Joseph Okimoto. So Dr. Okimoto is a son of immigrant parents who came to America from Japan in 1937 as Christian missionaries to work with Japanese immigrants <coughs> in California. He and his family were incarcerated in 1942 at the Boston, Arizona concentration camp as a result of Executive Order 9066, <clears throat> signed on February 19, 1942 by President Roosevelt that authorized the removal and imprisonment of 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, <clears throat> the majority of whom were American citizens. 11 years after being released from the Boston concentration camp, Joe was accepted into Dartmouth College in 1956 and went on to complete his first two years of medical school at Dartmouth Medical School, graduating in 1961. Transferring to Harvard Medical School, he received his MD degree in 1963. After completing an internship at King County Hospital, 
at the University of Washington, Seattle, and serving two years in the US Air Force. He underwent two years of general surgery training at the University of California, San Francisco, completed an MPH program at University of Washington School of Public Health, and completed psychiatry, psychiatry residency at the University of Washington. He also graduated from the Seattle Psychoanalytic Institute in 1994. Joe is a retired psychiatrist and has lived in the Seattle area since 1969. Besides maintaining a private practice in Seattle from, 1960, from 1980 to 2016, he served as medical director of the Asian Counseling and Referral Service from 1976 to 1987. He was also medical director of the Eating Disorder Unit at Swedish Hospital Seattle from 1991 to 2000. His other community involvement included civil rights advocacy in the Asian Coalition for Equality. He was appointed by then Governor Daniel Evans to the Washington State Commission for Asian American Affairs, serving as its first chair. Joe is married to Jean Davies Okimoto, a retired psychotherapist and author of 25 books. They have four children, six grandchildren, and recently, excuse me, and currently live on Bastion Island in the Salish Sea between Seattle and Tacoma. Welcome, Dr. Okimoto. Next, I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight's program. Dr. Chan graduated from Vassar College with a degree in anthropology and geography. She worked abroad in Indonesia for two years prior to returning to the US where she worked in multiple healthcare related positions, including work with the intellectually disabled and quality improvement for Massachusetts Medicaid providers. She eventually entered medical training at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and did her family medicine residency at St. Joseph Medical Center in Reading, Pennsylvania. She was a National Health Service Scholar and did her service on the Navajo Nation in Shiprock, New Mexico. It was here that Dr. Chan assisted in the hospital's goal to assure comprehensive, culturally acceptable personal and public health services to American Indian and Alaska Native people by providing full spectrum family health services, adolescent health in a school-based health clinic, and alternative care with osteopathic manipulative medicine. She also worked as a civilian physician in the military before returning to Philadelphia as family medicine faculty at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Since her return, Dr. Chan supervises the Homeless Project at St. Columba Safe Haven Residence in coordination with the psychiatry department to integrate mental health into healthcare screening. Dr. Chan has received several honors and awards, including the Jesse M. Young Memorial Award for exceptional service to the community and the Dr. John Wynarowski Royal Fund for Clinical Achievement and Humanitarian Characteristics. She currently oversees graduate medical occasion education at Nazareth Hospital and St. Mary Medical Center in Philadelphia, both hospitals with a mission to serve the underserved. Clinically, she teaches residents ways to integrate osteopathic medicine into patient care. Clinically, she teaches residents ways to integrate, integrate osteopathic medicine into patient care. Oh, I think I said that twice, sorry. <laughs> she is also actively involved with the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association and the National Adver Advisory Council for the National Health Service Corps. Welcome, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Okay, so um, before we start, um, I'd like to have you guys, we'd like to do a little bit of uh, um, audience participation. So I wanted to learn about, um, did you, any of you, learn in a US school about the Japanese internment camps? So if you can scan the QR code and then put in your answer. Okay, let's, old school. Who, who has heard of? In school, in school. Okay, good. Yeah. So quite a few, okay. Yeah. Um, and then the second question is, are you aware of the executive order 9066? Before, coming here. before, before <laughs> like hearing about this lecture. You are a well-educated audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, Okay, so before we start, I know Dr. Okimoto wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have this slide. Uh, Be brave enough. Yeah. I, 
I wanted to say something about I needed this encouragement in order to be up here. Because <laughs> as a retired psychiatrist, I am uh, much more comfortable listening than uh, speaking, especially in public. Uh, but I hope uh, you'll bear with me. Um, but I'd like to just thank um, Dr. McBride, the Office of Diversity, and Dartmouth uh, Health for sponsoring uh, this conversation uh, that matters. And looking at the uh, response to how many of you know about the incarceration, uh, I'm sure it matters to all of you. Um, mine is but one story of 120,000 other stories of uh, Japanese Americans uh, who were incarcerated during <clears throat> World War II. Uh, but perhaps my story has a bit of a twist in that serendipity brought, brought me to Dartmouth uh, just 11 years after uh, I was released uh, from a concentration camp. Uh, and I have to say something at this point, too, uh, because I sometimes struggle in public speaking uh, because trauma has a way of coming up unexpectedly as a flood of emotion. And sometimes it's hard to speak when that happens. So if that happens I, today, I, I hope uh, to beg your indulgence until I can kind of collect myself. I also want to thank you, the audience, for coming on a national holiday, which is celebrating uh, the presidents and hopefully the good deeds of the president. But today, the day of remembrance is a bad deed that President Roosevelt signed that led uh, to a my incarceration, and many others. Uh, and I also, also want to thank Dr. Chan for uh, her willingness to engage with me and hopefully save me from too much uh, uh, pain and suffering. <laughs> so take it over, Dr. Chan. <laughs> OK. I I told Dr. Okimoto tonight, it's my job to make him look good, so. <laughs> um, so uh, I know it, it seems like we have a really knowledgeable audience here, um, but I'd still like to kind of cover um, what exactly an executive order is, um, just so everyone is on the same page. Um, because I only know of one person who told me recently that she reads every single executive order that comes out, and that's our very own Dr. Lisa McBride. Um, she nerds out on it. Um, but it's apparently, it's a directive by the President of the United States that manages the operations of the federal government. So, you know, um, the President is given this leeway to sign these orders um, by Article Two of the U.S. Constitution as well as kind of an indirect delegation um, by the acts of Congress um, to do this. So he has a very large power um, in signing these executive orders. So I'm so glad that someone is monitoring what's happening, especially now. Um, so in order for us to talk more specifically about the executive order 9066, um, and to understand more about Dr. Okimoto's um, family and his history um, with regard to this order, um, we need to go back a bit further because it started way before that. Um, and so it's a history of racism that's continued. So Dr. Okimoto, can you give us a little bit about that history? Sure. Um... Anti-Asian racism really can be dated back to <clears throat> the mid-1800s when the uh, Chinese uh, coolie labor, as they were called, uh, came to America. And of course, 
there was uh, immediate response to having foreign individuals on the West Coast. And so there was increasing um, racism and laws that were discriminatory and eventually leading to immigration laws that stopped in the, eight, I think it was 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. And shortly thereafter, actually there was uh, violent vigilante mobs that uh, ran Chinese out of Chinatowns in Tacoma and Seattle. Uh, and uh, so when the immigration from China uh, diminished, then of course businesses were looking to other cheap labor sources. And that's when Japan started to provide uh, labor and immigrants began to come in. And again, there was reaction and racism with laws and immigration laws that uh, stopped in 1924 uh, with the um, Immigration Act that stopped essentially uh, Im immigrants from coming in from uh, Asia. Interestingly enough, my parents immigrated in 1937 and I believe they were able to uh, enter America because they were Christian ministers and uh, they happened to have been educated in um, a Bible college that uh, was run by uh, the Oriental Missionary Society, an uh, American organization. So I, I think that had something to do with their coming in. But of course, when Pearl Harbor happened, uh, the existing racism reached a peak with uh, war hysteria. So we'll get into that, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's unusual. Um, I think a lot of the uh, Japanese immigrants who came um, either were highly educated, like your parents, or they're more laborers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting um, difference. So, um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your family? Yes. Of course, my family story starts with my parents who were projected here. Um, and being Christian, they were uh, in a minority in Japan, of course, is Japan being a Buddhist and Shinto uh, religious country. Only about one or two percent of Japanese are Christians. Uh, but in addition to that, they were kind of non-conventional, uh, particularly uh, our mother, Kiria Kumagai Okimoto. Uh, she was the youngest of uh, six children born into a farming family in the southern island of Kyushu. And while other young women in the village who completed school, and, that, and by the way, the school uh, only went to the seventh grade, uh, women tended to then be married and start um, families. Uh, uh, Kiria, my mother, wanted to go to college and she convinced her father that uh, she should be allowed to go to this city and she completed a, a teacher's uh, uh, college. She returned to her village and taught for a while, but then decided that uh, she should uh, help build the school system or the existing school, which was really one elementary school, uh, to go as far as high school. Uh, so she went to Hawaii to study with the idea that then she would bring back the knowledge and help build uh, the school to include high school. But while she was uh, in Hawaii, her uh, elderly father died and she fell into a depression. Uh, and this was her personal crisis. And in the midst of that, 
a Christian, the wife of a Christian uh, minister, a Japanese American, befriended her, and that led to Kidia's conversion to Christianity. But the story doesn't stop there. When she returned home, uh, her eldest brother, who was now head of the family, gave her uh, an ultimatum. Choose between your family and your, or your faith. And she was uh, strong-willed enough and independent that she left home and made her way to Tokyo. And she enrolled in the Tokyo Bible College to become a minister. Uh, Tameichi Okimoto uh, also uh, grew up in a farming family, but he had a much harder life. Uh, back in those days, um, the wife uh, would go live with the husband uh, upon marriage. And how the wife got along with the mother-in-law determined the success of the marriage. <laughs> and unfortunately, the wife didn't get along with uh, the mother-in-law. And rather than taking the child with her, she was ex extruded from the family. And she went home. I think she later went on to marry and have a family uh, a different family. <laughs> Father remarried, uh, but unfortunately the stepmother didn't warm up to uh, my father. And what made matters worse is that at age 11, his father died, and so he was left with a stepmother who didn't care about him. And he ended up being sent to Formosa where a maternal uncle was stationed in the military. And he was raised by this uncle uh, in Formosa, uh, Taiwan now. Uh, when he uh, was a young man, he returned to Tokyo. And another personal crisis uh, occurred where he contracted tuberculosis. And it was in this personal crisis that, again, a Christian missionary befriended him, and he converted, went on to the same Bible college that Kidia uh, enrolled in. The rest of the story becomes conventional because they married after graduation. They were assigned the parish, and they had children. They had two uh, children before they were approached to uh, immigrate to uh, America. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if this is long-winded, but uh, uh, so uh, maybe we should stop there at, as far as the history of my parents, but in 1937, they did uh, immigrate to uh, California, and uh, they assumed uh, their ministry uh, uh, working with Im Japanese immigrants uh, on the west, on, actually in San Diego. Uh, so it's quite a story. I think yeah. you know it, it says a lot about um, the immigrant spirit that leads people to just kind of go abroad. And your mother is a woman after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, next. So December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor happened. Um, Japan attacked. Um, and that's where kind of, the, the, that's where the start of this um, internment camp and the executive order 9066 happened. So can you give us a little bit of context about what happened immediately after in the community um, the greater American community as well as the Japanese American community. Sure, sure. Uh, well, as you can imagine, the, the anti-Japanese uh, uh, sentiment w was uh, heightened uh, intensively. And we could have the next uh, slide. And there were many signs like this, uh, anti-Japanese signs. Uh, next. Yeah. 
And there were many more. Uh, and, and yeah, the next one. And of course, the military had a, a very uh, aggressive uh, anti-Japanese uh, attitude. Duet uh, on top was the general in charge of the Western Command. And he was very racist and uh, pushed uh, solidly for uh, incarceration. And the main person below him, I think his name was uh, Berenson, um, was equally uh, racist. Uh, now, um, interestingly, I, we did talk about Executive Order 9066. If you look at the way it was written, there's nothing written about Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. It only gives the authority to the military to d describe um, a sensitive military area from which they can choose to eliminate, and move, and incarcerate anybody. It, that's the way it's written. But of course, it was written sp with the idea that they were going to round us up, right? So um, I think they must have known that what they were doing was somewhat questionable, or at least needed to be hidden. Yeah, I mean, looking at these pictures, it's not very different than what um, happened with black people in the South, um, similar signs um, against the, Jap uh, the Chinese community, um, same things with Jews in, in Europe. Um, you know, so this is really, you know, a, a kind of um, a similar reaction to people who maybe look different yes. than yeah. mainstream. So, um, so can you explain a little bit more about the executive order and, um, you know, what are some of the factors that led to the signing a, of that order? Yeah. Yeah, well, certainly racism was the, the biggest uh, factor. Uh, and given the hi long history that I outlined uh, previously. But there certainly was economic uh, interest. The Japanese brought with them skills in uh, agriculture and fishing, and they were very successful. I, I read a, uh, uh, a piece about how they had 4% of the uh, tools for production, but they produced 10% of the output, and so uh, they were overproducing and doing quite well. Uh, so uh, there was a, a great push. Uh, and of course, uh, different uh, media tended to uh, sensationalize what was happening, publish, uh, uh, racist uh, articles and columns, uh, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the, the racism gets worse as, as um, the mainstream group kind of sees the minority develop oh, their yes. economic stability uh, yes. or gain, right. um, gain way into you know, um, and become competition, right, I guess. Right, right. And there was also, I forgot to mention, uh, war propaganda. Of course, uh, cartoons that uh, depicted the enemy, uh, Italians, Germans, and Japanese, in very uh, negative uh, terms. Uh, and uh, that was quite uh, upsetting and contributed to this um, executive order. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I was, uh, we, our college, my alma mater had our first um, Asian American studies course. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the pictures that we looked at was like how to tell Japanese and Chinese apart. I don't know, I think, you know. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Um, so, uh, so, 
after the order um, was signed by Roosevelt. Um, yes, we, we do have a slide of Roosevelt signing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then, um, you know, so a, lo a lot of the um, people um, were then had to pack up and leave. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like what happened with your family? Uh, could you uh, go back to the last slide? Uh, yeah, so on the right uh, is the uh, military order that was posted in the community on telephone posts uh, and giving instructions to the Japanese uh, community. Uh, of course, uh, aside the reaction to uh, Pearl Harbor and the larger community was uh, increase in uh, racism towards the uh, Japanese. Within the Japanese community, there was considerable fear and panic, uh, particularly because they knew they were going to be targeted. Uh, so many families tried to get rid of anything that was linking them to Japan. Uh, art, records, dolls, whatever. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, important uh, sentimental things. They didn't want to be tied in uh, the nation's mind with Japan. Of course, within hours of Pearl Harbor, the FBI were in the homes of leaders of the Japanese community, um, and they immediately arrested them with, without warrants or anything. And of course, there was no due process. Uh, everything was uh, a, uh, determined on a group basis. Uh, there was, uh, interestingly, the, there was no evidence of any espionage or uh, uh, illegal activities, uh, but that didn't matter. Um, uh, <clears throat> people's bank accounts were frozen by the government. Uh, and, you know, older individuals who were not farming or fishing lost their jobs. Students in school had to drop out, uh, some not being able to graduate. The Japanese community has been uh, sort of stereotyped at some, sometimes with being docile and submissive. But uh, there were three cases of um, uh, individuals who refused to be um, uh, arrested or, or uh, incarcerated. One was a university student at uh, Was University of Washington, Gordon Hirabayashi. Another was um, uh, an attorney, uh, Min Yasui, uh, who deliberately vi violated curfew so he would be arrested. Uh, and the third was uh, Fred Korematsu, uh, who was a young man, and he had an Italian-American girlfriend that he hid with because he didn't want to be arrested. And he went so far as to have plastic surgery so that he could escape uh, detection, but all to no avail. He was arrested, too. Their three cases actually went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, backed the military, saying it was... Uh, constitutional on the basis of military necessity. So, but there was resistance, uh, and it took 40 years before those cases got reversed. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But. Right. So, I mean, they said it was because of military necessity, but that didn't really happen to the Italians or the Germans, did exactly. it? Exactly, yeah. Right. So, um, can you go to the next so this is one of um, Dartmouth's own professors um, who basically said that th this injustice um, of the incarceration was a link in a chain of racism. 
Um, so it kind of, you know, what, what Dr. Akimoto has been saying really demonstrates this. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, then what happened to you? Because you also didn't go immediately to the camps, your right, family. Right. Well, just to uh, give an example of the ordinariness of our life uh, at the time of the roundup, our family was in quarantine for chickenpox at the time that we were supposed to report uh, at the site for roundup and uh, arrest. So we were about three weeks late, and the Army had to send uh, an individual truck uh, with soldiers, rifles, bayonets, and uh, to our house. And uh, my sister recalls quite vividly b being quite frightened about seeing the rifles. And uh, we were ordered onto the back of this uh, army truck. And at that time, our mother was six months pregnant with uh, our younger brother uh, sitting in the back of that truck. We were worried about her, her safety. We were then taken to the Santa Anita racetrack, which was a horse racing track, that was converted to a, a prison camp. Or they called it an assembly center, euphemistically. Uh, in fact, the government used all kinds of euphemism. Uh, relocation camp instead of what it was, was a concentration camp. Uh, and the arrest and roundup was called removal or evacuation. Uh, nothing close to what was really happening. The, the government uh, had to quickly develop uh, camps, prison camps. So they took uh, fairgrounds and racetracks and they quickly converted the horse stalls and animal shelters by painting them, you know. Uh, but certainly they didn't get rid of the stench of the excrements. And they built uh, army barracks in the parking lots. And these were rather flimsy uh, constructions. Uh, Santa Anita Racetrack housed about 8,000 at any one time. Uh, and our stay there was about three months. And uh, my mother delivered her child, uh, our younger brother, at, under these conditions. Of course, she was quite worried about um, the care of, of her newborn infant. And two weeks later, they put us on a train to uh, take us to a permanent concentration camp in the desert of uh, Arizona. And uh, let's see, I don't know whether you had any specific questions about No, I'd like you to kind of describe the situation yeah. there. Well, the, uh, uh, the permanent camp was uh, called uh, Poston Concentration Camp. And it was built on an Indian reservation in the western desert of uh, Arizona. And it's an interesting story how it came about that uh, the camp was built uh, on the reservation. The Office of Indian Affairs had tried for many years to acquire funds to uh, divert the Colorado River and develop an irrigation system into the reservation. There were four uh, Indian tribes uh, residing on the reservation. Uh, and uh, they asked the tribal council to um, make a decision about whether they approved of this plan to build a concentration camp. And uh, the council uh, voted against it, saying, we don't want to be part of uh, building a prison within a prison. Uh, but they were overruled, of course, 
by the Office of Indian Affairs, and they uh, constructed the camp with the idea that the funds could help also build the irrigation system and they could use the labor of the captive Japanese American men. This was not public, you know, and this uh, was discovered uh, after the fact uh, many years later. Uh, being built on a, a desert, of course, the temperature ranged from in the summer 115 degrees to uh, in the winter below zero, and the barracks obviously didn't provide much uh, protection. Uh, there were uh, frequent sandstorms that blew sand and dust through the barracks. Um, the photo on the right uh, represents one of the units in the barracks. Now the barracks were army spec, uh, 100 feet long, 20 feet wide, and divided uh, by five. And each uh, unit uh, was about 20 by 20. But there were no walls separating the units, and they only hung blankets and sheets to separate. So you can imagine uh, how much privacy there was. And if you know, it, it, the picture doesn't show, but the, the peak of the roof is uh, uh, open throughout the barracks, so sound and dust and everything could go through. There was no running water. Uh, there was one light bulb and a, a, a wood stove of some kind. For uh, personal hygiene, we had to use public uh, facilities for every block. We had to share showers, toilets, laundries with two to 300 other people. So you can imagine a, a logistical uh, nightmare for, for us. Um, and let's see, what is the next uh, slide? Yeah. So. Uh, this is uh, a slide of uh, my first grade class. And if you, I, I don't know if you could see closely enough to see the expressions on the children, but this is uh, an example of the impact of chronic trauma over, well, three and a half years, really, for us. And this picture uh, was probably taken in the last year that we were there. So these kids, including me up in the top right uh, next to the teacher, uh, or let's see, on the left, yeah. Um, we all uh, were quite uh, dispirited, as you, you can see. Um, just to comment that the community made every effort to try to resume a normal life as possible. Uh, sports and arts, dancing, dances, etc. But within the confines of a barbed wire, uh, that, that wasn't very uh, satisfying. Yeah, um, so once we kind of, um, once you guys were let out of the concentration camp, how did you pick up from there? I mean, there's a lot of trauma, as you can see, like you said, on the children's faces. Um, but I think that's kind of where it kind of started your journey in, in seeking healing, right, at that yeah. Yeah. time. So can you tell us a little bit about what your family did? And Yeah, um, I know time is going by so quickly, so I'll try to be fast about it. Uh, when we were released uh, September 11th, 1945, uh, my parents, uh, being ministers, uh, we returned to San Diego uh, to resume, resume uh, position uh, in the church. Uh, there was considerable anti-Japanese uh, racism. Uh, we kids went to public schools, and uh, we were called racial slurs. 
uh, and chased uh, home. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we uh, I think we can see kind of historical trauma, you know, um, and its impact on on uh, someone from when they are little. It just it it not something that is easily overcome. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I think in medical, in, in the medical world now, um, we talk a lot about um, adverse childhood experiences and how it has direct impact on medical health. Um, so, you know, this is a clear example of how, because you were, you were only three when you went in, and right. you don't even really recall everything. Yeah. Everything you, you yeah. talked about mm -hmm. was kind of from stories from your family, yeah, right? Yeah, right. I, I have uh, amnesia for those three and a half years, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but we had, uh, I was trying to say, we had uh, a neighbor, African-American family that was uh, welcoming to us. And they had two kids who were the age of uh, my uh, older uh, brother and sister, and they protected us. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about, because um, the 1960s was really when, when the civil, with the civil rights movement, you that was kind of where you got your awakening like you were headed to medical school um, at Dartmouth and maybe you can talk a little bit about that journey yeah um, actually that that's a little I was trying to work my way up to that okay <laughs> <laughs> just uh, the interest that, of time that's all yeah, <laughs> yeah I know time's uh, going by quickly but uh, a year later, um, in 1947, uh, my father was uh, transferred to a rural community north, uh, just, just south of Oakland. And the racism intensity really diminished. So our life took on, you know, pretty normal adolescent uh, growth and so forth. I wanted to talk about the serendipity that led to Dartmouth, okay? So uh, in my senior year of high school, we had actually moved to Pasadena uh, in my junior year, so I had to re-enter and all that. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to be on the football team, and I was co-captain with an outstanding young man who was an A student, student body president, and a terrific athlete. And <clears throat> we happened to be working together during Christmas break, uh, trying to make money for college. And um, he was recruited by uh, Dartmouth's football coach, Bob Blackman. And uh, he wasn't after me at all. I mean, I wasn't really that good. <laughs> But, you know, I was on the coattail of my friend. And so, but he invited me to the recruiting meeting. And uh, the long and short of it is, he invited me to uh, apply also. So my friend and I both applied, and we were both accepted. And we both came back, but uh, he only stayed one semester. He didn't like the snow, so. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds yeah. about right, yeah. Um, so that, that's how I got to Dartmouth. I, I had not even heard of Dartmouth. I didn't, you know, my being in an immigrant family, my, my dream was to go to a state, a state school. And uh, so when the opportunity came, though, I, I guess I didn't turn away from it. And, uh, so you were here for two years. And actually, um, one of your friends 
aunt um, was actually working at the internment camp, right? Yes. I love that story, so I, I, I wanted you guys to hear that. Yes. Actually, Don Bartlett is here somewhere, I think, yeah. <laughs> and um, in 2016, he, uh, he visited us uh, on Vashon, and he informed me that uh, his aunt, Dr. Agnes Bartlett, had passed away recently, and, and he was in uh, possession of uh, artwork and letters. Is that right, Don? Yeah, yeah. And it turns out that his aunt, who was a physician trained at Yale, uh, had grown up uh, a significant part of her life in Japan as kids of missionaries, right? And so she was bilingual and quite familiar with the Japanese culture. And she was uh, a good person to provide medical services uh, to the inmates at Poston. And it turned out she was assigned to post it. And I was curious to see if my tonsillectomy was done by Dr. Bartlett. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I looked uh, on, you know, the, our, the government kept amazing records of, of each inmate. And so my medical records, my school records, even my school scores were <laughs> there. Um, and uh, I had no uh, record of uh, Dr. Bartlett uh, taking care of me. But my mother suffered a second degree burn of her leg. Uh, and sure enough, she was treated by uh, Dr. Bartlett. And I don't know if you want to say anything. Uh, well, you mentioned that you discovered it from your, your records. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Well, what that was a Dartmouth connection, like right. six degrees, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you were here at Dartmouth for two years, and then you then went to Harvard? Well, for with, medical school. For you medical know, we, school, We yeah. had the three-year program where you can apply to medical school and then do your first two years. So I was here five years. OK, yeah. gotcha. Right. Um, and then, uh, um, and then you ended up in a residency for surgery, right. um, but then something changed, the civil rights movement, and I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had been searching since graduation to uh, try to figure out where I fit in medicine. Uh, and of course, you know, I wanted to, to do what uh, is in the American dream, you know, be successful, admired, uh, whatever. Um, so I was fortunate to get in the surgical program uh, at uh, UC San Francisco. And that was in uh, the height of the civil rights movement, uh, anti-war movement. Martin Luther King had been assassinated and Robert Kennedy and I began to feel that I was cloistered in an ivory tower. There was all this stuff going on in the community. And I read uh, Eldridge Cleaver's Soul on Ice and the, sh the blinders from my eyes <laughs> fell away. And I, I saw how uh, uh, racism uh, had affected me. So I, I left surgery. I, I wanted to be more involved. <clears throat> and um, I, I went to public health uh, sort of as a stop, uh, a temporary stopping point, and ultimately ended up in psychiatry. And looking back at the transition, uh, I think I was trying to figure out where I could address my own healing uh, uh, trauma, as well as uh, some professional uh, role that would be consistent with the healing process. So um, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up 
uh, in psychiatry. Uh, and you ended up taking care of populations that had sustained trauma. Yes, yeah, so I right? worked with uh, Southwest Asian uh, refugees, uh, and uh, uh, I gravitated to people who uh, patients who had been through trauma. I, I, I think it was an unconscious thing. I, it was not a deliberate uh, uh, thing on my part. Right. And, and now you're, you're spending a lot of time kind of talking about, like, uh, um, I, I know I, I heard your um, presentation on Fishong Islands Museum. Um, oh. Yeah, so you're yeah. spending a bunch of time kind of educating people about this. Well, yeah, I feel it's uh, my obligation to uh, tell my story as often as I can. So, uh, especially in this climate, uh, political climate today. I mean, uh, it's scary because there are threats that immigrants will be round up and put in concentration camps and so forth. So uh, the thing is that uh, people didn't speak up uh, uh, for me, so I, I feel I have to speak up. Yeah, I, I think all of us who kind of look different from mainstream America, you know, um, every time anything goes up on the news about something that another country did, that, but another, the country that, you know, we look like we're from, then we all kind of unconsciously have that, what's going to happen, yeah. you know? Um, so this is a, as current, even though this is historical, as current as it is now, mm -hmm. so... Yeah, um, I know we have a f like about ten minutes left. So I'm sorry um, I went on so long. <laughs> no, we wanted to hear your story, so I'd like to open it to um, Q and A. Yeah. Um, for Rose? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Joe, could you tell us a little about the remarkable unit formed by the young men from your <coughs> camp and the record that they had fighting in Europe? Yeah, um, it was the 442nd uh, uh, outfit, and they um, they were uh, segregated. It, it was all Japanese Americans, uh, both from Hawaii and and the mainland. Uh, and they had, uh, they were sent to Europe, and they had a splendid record, uh, enormous uh, number of casualties, um, and I think uh, they have the record for the most uh, Purple Hearts and uh, uh, other injuries. If you want to read um, Facing the Mountain by Brown, uh, part of his discussion is on the 442nd, and it, it's a... Um, now, what percentage of the young eligible men in the camp volunteered to fight? I, I don't know that statistics, but I, I know that uh, there were uh, individuals who refused to be drafted because they said, uh, I am not going to defend a country that is imprisoning my family and me. And so there were close to uh, 20,000 uh, people who refused uh, to be, quote, loyal. Uh, but there had to be a tremendous amount of pride in the record that that unit achieved. Yes, yes, there is today, uh, too. Um, yeah, it also splintered the, the community a, a lot as well, right? Even within families and stuff. Yes, yes. The, the loyalty oath was right. uh, very divisive. And, yeah. yeah. Is there another question? Yeah, back there. I, in some of the reading that I've done, I read that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt opposed her husband signing this. Does that ever come out in your discussions? 
Uh, it, that's correct. There, there were a number of uh, uh, people in leadership roles who opposed uh, the executive order. Uh, 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 Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Attorney General Bill, also he, he advised uh, Roosevelt uh, not to sign the order. But um, Roosevelt didn't pay heed to them. You know, it kind of skipped over your father's, uh, the Art of Gaman, and also the racetrack. Oh. Yeah, yeah, if we could do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is actually a wood carving uh, by my, my father. He taught himself Hebrew. And this, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know Hebrew, if anybody in the audience can interpret this. But uh, uh, I understand the translation is, God is here. And it was a source of comfort to him, I think. But on the back side of that uh, uh, carving is a very meticulously drawn map of the Santa Anita racetrack. Um, and I think that was uh, his effort to kind of contain his uh, worry, fear, and anxiety. Um, and this comes from a publication um, of a, a book of uh, art. Uh, it w actually was an exhibit that traveled America and Japan called The Art of Gaman. And the Gaman in Japanese means uh, the, the capacity to endure uh, uh, the seemingly unbearable uh, stress with dignity and patience. Uh, and the Japanese culture is uh, known for that quality. And um, in the book and the exhibit are uh, art objects that the inmates in the various camps uh, produced while they were incarcerated. And it, it, it really demonstrates uh, not only uh, how they handle uh, uh, boredom, and, but uh, also how they channeled their creativity into something productive. And, uh, so. The power of art to kind of save us. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think there was a question back there. Uh, have you forgiven the people who have hurt you? I'm, I'm have so, you forgiven the people who have hurt hurt you? Ah, uh, it's difficult. Uh, but I don't know who to actually direct my anger at at this point. Uh, but I think I've come to terms. I I, I think part of the healing is uh, coming to terms with what trauma you've been through. And uh, um, it's not something that one can change uh, because it happened in the past. But uh, I've, I feel, uh, obviously, it's not completely healed because I still have the emotions come up that uh, I, I don't have complete control over. But, uh, that's a good question. I'll think about it more. <laughs> Is there another question? Uh, hi, thank you, Dr. Okamoto, for speaking out today, and welcome back to Hanover. Um, as a current Dartmouth undergraduate, I was wondering what it was like to go to Dartmouth as a Japanese American back when it was a more homogenous racially homogenous place and what that was like. You know, I wanted to cover that, but I thought we didn't have time. But I'm glad you brought it up. In the first year, uh, I had just f freshly arrived on campus. My two roommates uh, were still with me, but um, uh, I went to answer an ad for uh, uh, a car ride to New York City. I saw it on a bulletin someplace. So I go to this fraternity and I knock on the door and the guy opens the door and I say, you know, I'm answering the ad and I 
want to see if I can get this right. The first thing out of his mouth was, gee, you speak English so well. I, I bet some of you have gotten that, right? I mean, well, what it, did, what it does, that as, as well as other interactions, it immediately put me in the class of others, right? So uh, that's not anything that any of my friends could have done about, you know, done anything about, or I could have done anything about. But in 1956, that was how things were. So uh, I, that was what I faced, being an other. And I think I did a pretty good job, actually. Or maybe my classmates might <laughs> disagree. More than a good job. <laughs> Can you tell, tell them how many Asian or students of Asian descent was actually in your class? Well, there was one other Japanese American, uh, and I, I never really got to know him. Uh, but out of a class, I think of what, somewhere around 800 or? 813, okay, great. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, and there were a sprinkle of foreign uh, students from Asia. I think there was a student from Hawaii. Uh, but no, there, there were not, there was not a critical mass. I'm so happy to see uh, people who look a little more like me uh, in the audience. I'm sorry? Did you have any contact with the silver medalist? Who was no, he was too, f you know, I was a lowly freshman, and uh, he, was, he was an Olympic silver medalist from Japan. So, uh, no, I didn't have much any contact. Hi, Dr. Okimoto. Thank you so much for um, telling us your story today. Um, I want to bring, I guess, my question in connection with today's conversation about kind of the infamous year of 2020 uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic and how there was kind of increased tensions with individuals of Asian descent during that time period. I was wondering if you saw any parallels with any other people's individual's experiences of experiencing perhaps um, Asian hate or animosity um, to your experience or have you noticed anything during that year that connects to your personal experience? You know, I, I don't think I can recall any blatant, aggressive uh, racism towards me. I think most of what I've encountered has been subtle. Uh, so I can't, you know, and I, I, it's hard for me to imagine during the pandemic the anti-Asian uh, uh, violence that has occurred. It, it kind of astounds me, really. Um, but I, I'm not sure I, I can give you any more than that. Were you already retired and living on Fashan Island at that time? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so he was kind of in a more insulated community already. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, but, but even at Dartmouth on the campus, I think there was not overt blatant racism uh, that I encountered. It was more this uh, being aware of, of, you know, I mean, I came from a poor family, and there was such a discrepancy, social, class-wise. And I was an other in that sense, you know, but that was, I think the biggest uh, hurdle to get over was that being an other, you know. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's give our distinguished guests a hand. <laughs> Dr. Akamoto, I just want to thank you so much for coming home, coming home. And I just want to say how humbled I am to be able to work with you the last four weeks to put this together. I know that we, it was something you've never told, he's never told his story. And so each of you, I want you to think about this time we had together that you heard Dr. Akimoto's story. And my challenge to you is this time next year 
is to tell everyone about the Day of Remembrance and what happened when President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Tell everyone that you know that it was wrong and that it was a racist policy. I want to also thank his, your lovely wife, Jenny. Thank you so much for allowing us to work with him these last four weeks for two hours every Wednesday. We appreciate it. And just again, Dr. Chan, of course, much love uh, for moderating this and, and just bringing everything together on behalf of our office. So thank you all for coming. Uh, please, uh, before you leave, come up and tell our wonderful guest, Dr. Akamola, thank you for coming home to Dartmouth.